This is Mr. Vandergriff, and I'm here with the Great Insect Adventure. And I want to go over the reasons of why you should do this project. Why should we study insects? Well, did you know that half of all animals are insects? If you take all the animals in the world, over 50% of them are insects. Yes, insects. An ant, a flea, a fly is an animal. Now, this is a famous biologist E.O. Wilson, and he broke it down this way. You can see that there are 751,000 insect species. But when you compare that with other things, there's only 1,000 species of viruses or 69,000 of fungi or algae. Right? If you even consider this, when it comes to like birds, there's 10,000 species of birds. Or if you look at mammals, there's about 5,500 species of mammals. Or if you think even sharks, there's only 440 species of known sharks. So when it comes to insects, they dominate. They're everywhere. And that's one really good reason to study these animals. So here's Dr. Terry Irwin, and he is using a biological um, chemical called pyrethrin, which used knocks out invertebrates. And it's a, called the technique is called fogging, insect fogging. And then they just rain down... Um, after a little while, and they collect them in these plastic tarps. If you've seen the movie Arachnophobia, this is exactly what they were doing to capture that those spiders and insects. And then they collect them, and they categorize them, looking for new species and studying them. It's just unbelievable, the beauty and the diversity that they've been finding. Look at this. These, wow, amazing. And... Um, we know that out of all of the insects, 25% are beetles. Believe it or not, there are 350,000 species of beetles. Again, compare that with only 440 species of known sharks. Unbelievable. They come in all sorts of colors. Just whether the metallic looking, just gorgeous. This one's from Papua New Guinea. This is a beautiful little weevil, really small guy. Um, or huge, super, like or really, really tiny, just a couple millimeters. Or weird shape, like this giraffe beetle, um, this stag beetle here, is another, looks like another type of weevil. These are tortoise shell beetles, of course, because they look like little tortoise shells. I think this is a Japanese stag beetle, metallic, maybe stag beetle there. This is a buprested beetle, which is a bullet-shaped beetle. Um, these are goliath beetles. These are like as big as my fist. I've got an old picture here when I was in Gabon, Africa. There's one climbing on me, and there's a couple that were collected. And here's Philippe, uh, the doctor, the expedition doctor there. These are massive. These are wood-boring beetles, and these are from the Amazon. Again, these are both dead because they have sharp mandibles that could cut right to uh, through your skin to your bone. So again, um, when you take a beetle apart, here's all the different parts. They do have two types of... Uh, Two sets of wings. This is the elytra, which usually isn't for flight, but actually protects the delicate flight wing. Oh, look at the horns on these guys. Again, that's dealing with our structure and function. There's got to be a reason for that. Antennae here, also structure and function. Usually have chemoreceptors there. Um, I call these the uh, Charlie Brown beetles. This one looks like Chuck. Hey, Charlie Brown. Uh, but again, they're just warning against, hey, I think these usually are like fungus feeders and they'll eat things that are toxic and just warning, hey, don't eat me, right? And these are the click beetles right here. And um, we ran into a click beetle uh, that was in the Peruvian Amazon rainforest and it, it had, uh, we called it bright eyes and it had glowing green eyes, but eye spots. And underneath when it would fly, its belly would start to illuminate kind of a reddish color. It was, it just looked like sci-fi. It was amazing. Look at this beetle here. It kind of looks like a Megadeth, like heavy metal skull right here. But some of these are supposed to look like fecal matter, I think, to kind of protect themselves. This is a Chilean uh, beetle here. And these giant, um, mandibles here are used to grab another opposing po opponent and throw them off the tree sap so that they can get first to be to mate with the females but when they fly they're they're kind of like top heavy like this and they kind of wobble through uh, as they fly um this is a really cool i think is this one gelotus yeah this one is gelotus it hangs on a tree and supposed to mimic like a piece of fruit kind of as its camouflage until I guess something eats it, right? This would be a harlequin beetle. 
get an idea of how big these are. These are also from the Amazon rainforest. Uh, another type of beetle, I'm not sure this one. Again, I think from the tropics. But a lot of their elytra, that wing cover right here, is used as uh, a jewelry. And some of, like the Bora Indians, I believe, this might be a squirrel monkey's head, and then the elytra, and then some other bean, uh, some type of pot or something for uh, jewelry. But again, others, this was, I think this was from um, down in Mexico, I think in Mexico City. I don't know if they still do this, but in the past, they would take these ironclad beetles and glue diamonds and jewelry on them with a little gold chain with a little safety pin and then just put that on their fancy dress and then you'd have this living piece of jewelry walking around as you were visiting the museum or the opera or some you know very you know hoity-toity thing that you would attend and then you'd come home take it off and then put it in a little thing of oatmeal or whatever it would eat and then you know the next event you would have your beetle living jewelry so Another reason to study insects is just to really appreciate their beauty and wonder and their variety, right? Most people think they're gross and nasty, but no, take a look at this. I, when I think of a grasshopper, I think of green or brown or dull. This one's got every color of the palette. Like it almost looks like someone took some paint to paint this one. And this is a walking stick. This is, um, they've just located, uh, discovered, the, I think it was in Vietnam or Laos, a walking stick that was almost like, a foot and a half. It was 32 centimeters long. Unbelievable. And this praying mantis is gorgeous. Look at this glass-winged butterfly. A silk moth. And this Picasso bug. And the golden tortoise beetle. And this, obviously, a larval stage of this um, Dryandra moth caterpillar. Gorgeous. It looks like those giant eye spots. And then you can't, it's hard to see this one. This is an orchid manis. Uh, looks like the flower, an orchid flower. Of course, ladybugs. I absolutely love the uh, ladybugs and their color. They're so simple but beautiful. And this plant hopper. Look at that snout. Woo! Look at that thing. And this one's the owl moth. Although to me, I would call it the elephant moth. I see the two eyes and the elephant's trunk right here. Look at how gorgeous that fruit fly is. And the colors and the iridescent and the, uh, it's just gorgeous. And this is a cropia uh, moth, caterpillar. And this last one is the jewel caterpillar. Uh, and if you zoom in there, again, these are insects, but the larval stage of insects, just beautiful and gorgeous. Swallowtail, which we have here in San Diego. Insects are definitely beautiful. But again, we should study them because a lot of times the insects, they're just wonderful. They make you wonder, like these fire ants. Like take a look at this video and see if this makes you wonder about anything. So they're floating on top of the water. They're all holding each other together. They can't break through that surface tension of the water. And even army ants will do this. They'll be like a million with the queen inside and they'll be floating on the water in this like, like living raft. Pretty cool. And the, gira the giraffe-necked weevil. Like, look at that thing. Like, what in the world does it need that neck for and that long? So take a look at this. Uh, I'll show about 10 seconds of this video clip. It's a giraffe-necked weevil. And this is a male. And this is the reason for his extra long neck. And if you want to know, then you should go Google it and look it up and do some research. This next one is unbelievable. This one's called a burying beetle. And they, these antennae, they got some chemoreceptors here so they can actually find where the dead animal is. Believe it or not, these guys are endangered since 1989. Uh, they're in the Midwest. And they will locate a dead animal, whether a rat or a gopher or a squirrel or a bird. And then with their sharp mandibles, they'll go ahead and strip off the fur or the feathers and skin the whole thing. And then from there, they'll spit this big saliva goo all over this meat ball of a carcass that is antifungal agent so that funguses won't start to eat and bacteria won't start to eat this naked carcass that they've just stripped and then they'll go ahead and lay their eggs inside the flesh and then the fl the once the eggs turn into the larvae they the parents will actually eat 
chunks of the flesh, chew it up, and then spit it back into the mouth of these little larvae as they chirp like little birds. So this really isn't happening in the insect world that much, right, with birds and other higher level animals. But with insects, it's like, you know, it's like, have a million eggs and hopefully some of you will survive. But not with these burying beetles. They'll have, you know, four or five or six and they'll actually have a lot of parent involvement with it. Here's just the life cycle again. The dead animal, they lay the eggs and then one year later they emerge, they come out as adults and then repeat the cycle. Pretty cool. Makes me in awe and wonder. And we should study insects as well because this the variety. We can learn so much from these are just a couple butterflies or the beetles or the weevils or just the ants. Even in one tree in the Amazon rainforest, they located, E.O. Wilson found 43 species of ants in one tree. That's more species than are found in all of like the United Kingdom. Bees, look at the variety with their bees and our grasshoppers. They're just so numerous. And they obviously help pollinate, right? Whether it's a beetle or a moth or a, a bee, obviously taking the pollen, which contains the sperm cells, the sex cells of the plant, to the female part of the flower. And that's why they call it the birds and the bees, right? And there's some crops that are pollinated by bees. So again, scientists are pretty concerned. It made it on the front cover of Time Magazine, A World Without Bees. If you've ever seen the bee movie, right? See what happens when all the bees die. And that's actually what's happening is that worldwide they've been declining. This shows it's going up, but I do believe it's back in decline. And scientists aren't sure. They're asking questions. Is it a pesticide or is it some type of fungus or a bacteria? What's causing these bee colonies to decline worldwide? And they're a great uh, food source. Entomophagy is what it's called. Um, and I will do a whole video on just, and I, at the end, I'll eat some insects for you. Okay, but people all around the world, it's high protein. I've eaten insects. Um, uh, I can't say they taste that amazing unless they're covered in chocolate, but I have eaten them. And biomimicry is another great reason why we should study insects. You might not know this, maybe some of you do, but there was a little plant that stuck on this guy's leg in his sock, and then when he pulled it off, he's like, hey, look at these tiny little hooks that are stuck to my sock. And then he figured, you know what? I could make something like that. What's this called? Yeah, it's called Velcro. And so he ripped off nature's idea to make Velcro. So that's what's called biomimicry. You can actually measure in this in certain colleges, type of engineering, it's really, really cool. So scientists, entomologists have been studying the eyes of insects so they can make these cool drone camera lenses that can see 180 degrees and they're, they're learning from studying the insects. Or even this, if you've ever heard a cricket and how loud they are, but they're so small. And what part of their body is making that high-pitched sound so loud, but with such a small little speaker? And is there a way we could learn from that and make a smaller and better hearing aid? That's what this article I read was talking about. Or this one, scientists studied insect wings, and then they made some wind turbines, those things that spin around, right, and create energy. And by designing it after, right, taking the ideas from nature, they designed um, one that was 35% more efficient. That is huge. Here's a dragonfly that was caught in Ramona. You can see their wings, how detailed they are, that structure and function. But notice this little mark right here. It's called a stera, um, terastigma. It just wings, it means wing mark, and it's a little heavier to give stability to uh, the wing. Okay, take a look at this clip. I'll show this video clip just for a couple seconds. Here we go. Dragonfly wings have something on them called the pterostigma, which is Latin for wing mark. You may have seen them before. This is a dark cell on the leading edge of the wing that's heavier than the rest of the wing. At a certain velocity, thin wings begin to automatically vibrate, which makes it impossible to glide quickly. So if you want to watch the rest of that video, it's called Smarter Every Day, and it's about insect wings. It is unbelievable. But again, we want to learn about the benefit beneficial and the harmful insects even in San Diego, right? So I know that we do have um, killer bees that have made their way all the way up from Brazil up to San Diego. Uh, this is in 2011. And again, looks just like a regular bee, but again, it's been um, crossed with an African, it's been Africanized, so it's a much more aggressive. Um, so again, those can be very dangerous. Uh, 
uh, some of you might not know this, that insects have been used in warfare, entomological warfare. And I was like fascinated by this. Like, for thousands of years, humans have used insects as weapons of war and terror and torture, whether it was a local tribe that took a wasp nest and then put like mud over it and then got a bunch of them in the middle of the night, threw them, cracked them over the heads of their enemies, right? But one that I find that was so amazing in this century was when um, the Japanese took this oriental rat flea and inside here you can see that there's this bacteria Yersinia pestis it's a bacterium it's this black right here and that is responsible for causing the plague yes the plague so if this flea bites you more than likely you're going to get the plague um, and it's horrible we know that way it, it wiped out so many people right what a, almost a third of the world's population um, in the past so check this out um, this was called Operation Cherry Blossom at Night and so we're in war, obviously, with Japan. And what their target area was Southern California. It's actually, it was, part of it was in San Diego. And what they were going to do, let me go here. Um, I, you can read this. You can pause it and read this. But basically, let me just summarize. They were going to take submarines, and they were going to take aircraft, and they had torpedoes in the submarines, and they had bombs. And in these torpedoes and these uh, bombs, they were going to be filled with fleas that had the Y. pestis bacterium, and they were gonna drop them in San Diego and other places, and all those fleas would bite all the people and wipe them out and kill them. But it was called off one month uh, because Jap the Japanese surrendered. They surrendered, I believe, in August, August 15th, 1945, and this attack was gonna be taking place September 22nd. So unbelievable thinking about that. And others have used yellow fever and uh, cholera to um, use that in warfare. So again, just some reasons of why we should study insects and what we can learn from them. So hopefully you found this video interesting and helpful.